Well, good morning. Somebody's joined us. Identify yourself. Let us know who's out there. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio. I'm Bruce. I'll be uh, doing your narration and showing you some pictures. Well, good morning, Lynn and Fern. Welcome aboard, you guys. All right, and today uh, we're going to have a session that we call the Glass Blowers or the Artist's Choice. So the folks, the guys will let us know what it is they're going to make. And uh, in some cases, I may know ahead of time and I'll tell you. But otherwise, uh, we're in for surprise. We don't have an agenda that, agenda today specifically. Hello, Joanna, Jennifer, Tracy, welcome aboard. So I do know that the first piece is going to be made by Todd. And he's going to use this fishnet pattern that you see in this purple bowl here. But he's going to make a platter out of it. So he'll be using that design element, but in a completely different shape. And then from there, we'll find out what the guys have got in store for us. So welcome to our studio. And then Todd's in the process of sitting up, setting up right now. Good morning, Jen Johnson and Sharon. Welcome aboard. Okay. And in fact, uh, while Todd's setting up, I'm going to peek around the corner and ask Josh or Theta for the little piece of paper that helps me identify who won last week's prize. Michelle Vecchio. Michelle Vecchio. Okay, so I don't need the piece of paper. Michelle Vecchio, congratulations. And look at this, look at this motley crew here. Todd's doing all the work and they're just hanging out. Yeah, the loving life, okay? Maybe a couple lawn chairs out in the yard and uh, now they're all working hard. Well, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Hey, hey. Fine, good morning. Nice to see everybody. All righty, so there we go. All right, so Michelle Vecchio, congratulations. I'll come on over here and show you and everybody else what you won. And that would be this beautiful swirl frit bowl here. So that's a, a really great one right there. And the prize for next week is going to be this little vase with the green swirled frit. So there you go. Keep the comments rolling. You'll be entered into drawings. If you were with us last week and didn't catch the postings on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, there's a marvelous margarita glass that Josh made right there. So you can see that's really quite a tall boy. It's even bigger than the pitcher next to it. So uh, that's, uh, that's from last week. Hello, Patrick Foley. Sue, welcome aboard. Okay, so uh, let me show you a little bit of what we got here. All these items are in our catalog. You can go on artofire.com and check out our, our uh, list of wares and all the pictures. We've got ornaments, we've got hearts, we've got uh, vases and bowls. We don't sell the flowers with the vases, but you can take care of that part of it. Uh, and we've got many, many more things in the catalog that you won't see here. And so let's, uh, we got t-shirts, okay. Uh, you can order up a t-shirt. We've got a brand, some brand new designs for ornaments. We've got these uh, diamond shaped ornaments that uh, our friend uh, Romero Camarillo made the mold for us and so we've started making ornaments in those shapes and everything. So there we go with uh, what's up and sitting back there in the corner all on its lonesome is a gift certificate sample. You can order a gift certificate and we'll be glad to send whomever you give it to whatever they want. Alrighty, so that's what's going on there. And as we turn around, it's looking like Todd's not out here. I bet he's in the back gathering some color. And he is, okay, so Todd's picking up the color. What colors will the uh, fishnet platter be, Jeff Todd? This is a, uh, it's a mix of Mountain blue, which is a sort of a half tone of the cobalt, not quite as dark, but still a really pretty blue. Uh, an aqua, which I just put in. Mm. And then this is a brilliant copper blue. These are all zero size frit. We talked about frit on the YouTube portion earlier. This is zero size frit, fine grain, not powdery 
it just sort of clings to the color or to the clear a little differently. It goes on a little more uniformly than powder does. Okay. And then we need uh, cobalt for a lip wrap. So oh. we're going to mix these up. This will be, this will be the fishnet portion. We're going to then put a white powder background on the final gather on the most outer layer and then we'll turn this inside out. So you won't see this until we do the final yeah. reveal, I guess you know. it, it remains a mystery until the final opening. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so about two more minutes. Okay. So uh, Todd mentioned to you that he's going to be using the colors first to create the fishnet pattern. He'll be using the optic mold for that. And he's blowing in that right now just to clean it out. I what? have my standard issue safety glasses and I have my hard to fire safety glasses. Oh, okay. It's a joke. <laughs> I didn't say it was funny. There you go. Okay, so he's going to put the color mix on first. That'll be the interior of the bowl. And you will see the pattern a little bit before he covers it up with the white. But the beauty of having these transparent colors backed up with white is that it makes the color pop a lot more. So there you can see they're still kind of separated. He's just going to ladle them back and forth between those two bowls. They'll mix in completely and you won't be able to distinguish one from another in a few minutes. You'll see all the colors mixed in. So those are transparent colors, and when this platter is finished, when you look down into the platter, you'll see the transparent glass, but light will be going through it. It'll hit the opaque white, the perfect Whoa. mix. Good morning, Barbara. Welcome from Germany. Good afternoon. So uh, the thing about having that white backdrop is bounces the light back to you and it really makes those transparent colors pop. In fact, this purple vase here or bowl is a good example of that. There's the fishnet pattern you see. In this case, the white was gathered first. The white forms the backdrop. If we look down in the bowl, we can see there's white down in there. And then when your eye perceives the light, it's going through the transparent and then back at you. So that's a, a really cool way to back it up. If we want something that's not quite like that, this little bowl that uh, Michelle won is, uh, is his perfect example of one that's not backed up with another color. Okay, so there we go with that. And uh, good morning, Ramiro. Thank you, Joanna. We believe most everything in here is quite beautiful. I really enjoy making all the glass. <laughs> Okay, so we're just about set here. If some of you are joining us late, today's theme is uh, the glass blower's choice, the artist's choice. So Todd's uh, explained what he's going to be doing here, what he'll make for us. And uh, Kristen Zumar says she loves the gold with the honeycomb pattern. Well, I got a feeling that you're probably going to see that a little bit later if you stick around. They've dropped a few hints about what they're going to do. And uh, that was one of Josh's hints. I don't know if he'll do exactly those colors in the honeycomb or perhaps this uh, white base back here. But we've got uh, lots of good glass blowing in store for you. And whoa, it's already started. Here comes Todd with his first gather of glass. using the marver table to shape the glass. Notice how as he changes the angle of the iron, the glass becomes more cylindrical. When he holds his hands a little bit below the level of the tabletop and rolls, it forces the glass off the pipe. Now by inverting that angle, he made a conical shape on the end. Now he blows and traps air and there goes the bubble. Okay, so this has got, that will be the uh, interior of the platter. So if you're putting anything into this platter, you won't be putting it onto white glass, you'd be putting it onto this clear. He's going to let that cool off a good bit. We're here to gather right now from the furnace, which uh, has glass at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
it would cause that bubble to collapse. It would get misshapen. He could recover from it, but by simply waiting a few minutes or a few seconds, he gets that under control and now he can gather just fine. So as he told you, he'll be uh, doing the color pickup first and then he'll be overlaying that with white. The tool he's using now is called a block. It's a cup of cherry wood. It's been cut to a specific shape got a handle on it for the ease of use and that shapes the glass up and also chills the outside just a little bit. You'll notice that he has to keep turning the iron in order to keep it centered. Centering is just uh, the practice of keeping the glass equally distributed around the central axis of the pipe. Ramiro, I'll pass your request on to Josh. <laughs> Again, shaping the tip or the end of it into a conical shape. That's going to keep the bubble from expanding too far down that direction. A little smoothing there. And now once again, just a little pressurized air in the pipe. The bubble comes on out and now a little gentle reshaping. So what he's done with these two gathers here is to build up mass. This is going to allow him to make a rather large platter. So by having two layers of clear here, when he goes in to gather, he's effectively increased the diameter of the pipe. He's going to be gathering on something that's about uh, two and a half to three inches in diameter instead of the end of the pipe, which is just one inch in diameter. So he has increased the surface area. He'll be picking up a heck of a lot of glass. A little bit of coffee. Gets it going. Yeah. Maybe. I totally get that. And color frit. Color frit this gather? Yes, sir. Okay. So he's got the volume he's going to need. He'll pick up a good bit more glass. We may be able to see how the viscosity of the glass just runs off if he needs to strip any off. It's a good idea to gather a little more than you need or exactly what you need and let some run off rather than wind up short. By pointing the iron straight down, the glass is still fluid enough that it runs right off. It begins to turn and brings it up to level and that little tail of glass burns itself off. Yes, Jennifer, uh, we're not sure it's coffee. Uh, none of us have ever taken a drink out of it, but we take his word for it. All right, so now he's going to coat this with frit. I'm not trustworthy enough. <laughs> so he's got a good coating of the frit mixture on there. For those of you that had just joined us a few moments ago, we'll get a little picture of this. These are three colors, three kind of variations on blue. He's got a brilliant copper blue. He's got a, uh, a mountain blue, which is a, a shade or two lighter than, say, the dark cobalt blue. What was the other one, uh, Todd? The turquoise? Yeah, turquoise. Turquoise. Aqua. Turquoise. Uh, it's the 49. Or aqua. Okay. On, uh, not on the Pantone scale. It's okay. <laughs> so he's got all I mean, of those big colors. Color, uh, there we go. All righty. Yeah, they are kind of like the uh, peacock colors, uh, Bridget. Oh, blue on blue, Ted. Who was that? Tommy Venton? And how many of you out there know the name of that singer? <laughs> We're going to see if Ted does. Okay. Another coating of the Frit Mix. Get a nice full coating on this. It's going to blow out to be quite large. So if he only went through the Frit one time, 
as he moved on through the piece and it inflated and stretched, they'd separate quite a bit. He'll also be taking the gather of glass and twisting the frit into lines. Well, hello, Cindy. Welcome to the welcome to the party. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so Todd is making a. Oh, Georgiana knows who Bobby Benton was. Okay, very good. All right, so. Uh, the frit that's on there now would appear just as dots. Todd shaping it up to get a nice uniform shape, and then what he'll do in a few moments is make those dots turn into lines. And he'll do that by twisting primarily in one direction. It'll take a couple of turns to do that. Okay. Oh, we're going into the optic mold. We're going to get lines that way and twist them. My bad. Okay. So we've got a multi-ridged optic mold down there. There's like 32 ridges in that. That's uh, going to get some really fine lines in it. And then to get his fishnet, Todd will blow hard into that and then twist the ridges. Gets the glass really hot, drops it into the mold. In fact, you can even see it run a little bit. It blows very hard in there. When he comes out, it'll have ridges on it. There we go. And then he'll create the first half, or the first part, of the fishnet pattern. So when he twists this now, it will form lines out of those ridges. And they'll be going at about a 45 degree angle to the center line of the piece. So by simply bringing it to the marver, twisting it in place, you'll gradually see those lines start to curve. By changing the angle, he can push it further toward the end of the piece, and he'll keep going with that till he's happy with what he's got. Now that angle right there pushes the glass off of the blowing iron. You can see it formed like a little collar right onto the piece there. That angle helps push the glass off. Glass that's on the blowing iron is really just kind of wasted. We've got no use for it. In fact, it just goes in the cullet bucket. All right. So there's his uh, twisted lines on there. Cheryl Lee, welcome aboard. Um, are you from Colorado? I'm just curious. I, we've tried to keep track of people, quite a few of you we know. All right, here we go for the second line in the optic mold. This overlies the uh, twisted ridges that he had. And now you'll see those straight lines in it. And he'll gradually just start twisting this a little bit and get that beautiful fish net. Poor man's reticello. Poor man's reticello. What the glass on the pipe called? Uh, if you're talking about the glass that remains on the pipe after we're pretty much done with the piece, that's called the moil. Now he's turning to clockwise, under counterclockwise, or as we like to say, Wittershins. the art of fire, Wittershins. Yes, Cheryl, I, I thought we'd, uh, I'd seen you on a website as far as glass blowing out there. Well, welcome aboard. So Todd is making a fishnet pattern uh, platter. And what he's doing right now is creating the fishnet pattern. So for those of you that just uh, joined us, the, um, the glass is a mixture of kind of blue shades. And you can see the crisscross pattern in there right now. It's a little more difficult to see. I'm going to show you a sample of it if you just joined us. This, this uh, bowl has the same pattern that you'll be seeing later on the inside of the platter. So, uh, yeah, the glass that is the remainder on the pipe is called the moil. 
the glass that uh, we pick up is called the Parazon or uh, Gather. Um, so those are the terms for the glass that you see on the pipe. Now it's back over to the vent and a larger block. The block will stabilize the glass, put a little skin, if you will, or uh, straighten the outside of it, stabilize it a little bit. You can see that it's still moving just a tad, but uh, Todd wants that to get to the point that he's got that fully under control, then he'll put a little more air into it. Yes, yeah, Cindy, we love the pattern too. It's a, it's a beautiful look. So we've got the fishnet on there. This angle right here again pushes the glass off the pipe. If you look at the glass, it's within the uh, first two inches or so, you can see it elongating and picking up a taper. And now he marvers the other end by inverting the angle. That cools it down there so that it doesn't expand excessively. And now he traps some air in the pipe with his finger. It's got no place to go but out into the hot glass. You'll also notice that he waited a little while and marvered and cooled things. He didn't want that to just explode out into the glass. It's been totally out of control. So by waiting and cooling, he's able to control the growth of that bubble. You hold it up just with the window in the background, Todd, so we can see a little bit through there. Okay, thank you. Oh, what I wanted to point out to you all is the glass is fairly thick at this point. The bubble does not extend all the way out to the sides. If it did, it would be very hard to control. So he's got a little bit thicker wall, particularly down there toward the pipe, and this is going to give him stability. So with the stability then, He's able to expose it to a lot more heat and keep it under control. Here he goes for the gather. When he pivots downward, he's taking the glass out of the pool of furnace. And when he lifts back up, yes, he went in the mold twice, Cheryl Lee. Now he's going to strip the glass off. It just drains right off because of its viscosity. When he brings it to level and continues to turn, that little string of glass just burns itself right off. Okay, he's holding it up to let it fall back toward the pipe a little bit. And now notice he gathers the white glass close to the pipe first. If he had pointed it down and done the other end first, the glass is hot enough that it would have pulled away from him. So now he changes the angle and he's getting more down toward the tip of the piece. The tip down there will be the bottom of the bowl, okay? What's up near the pipe will be the lip or the opening of the platter. So he's covering all of that. He'll do this a couple of times. And as we told you earlier, once the white frit goes on, you're not going to see the pattern until we open it up again. But if you're one of the ones that just joined us while he takes this reheat, this is the pattern that you'll see on the inside. It'll be uh, shades of blue or blue-green instead of purple but that's the fishnet pattern. Right now Todd's heating it up and he'll come back and he'll pick up a good bit more white. We'll step over here so we can get a good view. Notice again, gathering close to the iron with the glass pointed upward just a little bit. Keeps it under control when it comes out of the glory hole so hot. By inverting the angle, he's able to cover the rest of the gather or parazon. and gets a little more right on the end of it so that the bowl doesn't have, the platter doesn't have a blank spot down in the middle. So the glory holes, as we mentioned earlier, are uh, basically empty chambers. They're ceramic tubes, if you will, that run at about 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, hello, Kimberly, welcome aboard. 
We're making a uh, fishnet pattern platter right now. And since we are getting more people joining us in progress, we'll go over the details every once in a while or explain where we are. Right now, Todd is gathering white frit or granular glass on top of the gathers that he's already worked. So if you've just joined us, Kimberly, you have the mystery reveal coming later, okay? Because you can't see the pattern that Todd has in there. It's covered up completely, but when he opens up the platter, we'll see. Let's see, what is that tall white face on the table behind the purple bowl? The pattern looks interesting. Yes, it is like a beehive, Shirley. Um, another gather of white, Todd? Nope. nope. Okay, he's had all the all the white frit he can he can handle. This is like an all you can all you care to eat buffet. Okay, so now it's time to start shaping this up, getting a little air in it. He'll use the marver to shape right now. And from back here you can see the angle that he's rolling there. That's what gets the glass off the pipe. Also cools it right there and controls it. Now he inverts the angle so he can get the other end of the glass cooled and shaped. And now he's going to blow, and he's not going to pressurize the air, he's just going to do what we call a free blow. He's just going to blow into the pipe. When the glass is hot, it's really not difficult at all. Okay? We've got some wet newspaper to cool and to shape. The interesting thing about that is, by having, uh, oh, about seven or eight sheets of newsprint, and we use whatever newspaper we happen to have on hand, by using the newsprint and folding it into about a seven inch by eight inch pad and wetting it thoroughly, it's a perfect insulator and allows you to grab the glass, which is really pretty counterintuitive. I said some bad words the first time somebody told me to go ahead and grab the glass with the newspaper. But I'm going to show Cheryl Lee this vase she's asking about real quick. And yes, it is a honeycomb pattern, okay? And we have a honeycomb pattern here in this uh, honey pot. Okay, and I got a feeling Josh may be using something similar to this later on. And we'd like to thank Romero Camarillo for making these molds for us because uh, they really are quite nice to use. He's marvering the tip now, not only to shape, but primarily to cool so that when he blows, it does not inflate excessively. And he's going to cut the ubiquitous jack line. Nobody's going to want this platter with a four and a half foot piece of steel attached. So by cutting this line close to the blowpipe, he's got a point of separation. Ah, oh, Patricia Van Wee says she has a similar small vase made by Todd in 2002 that she purchased in Sterling. And loves it for flowers. And glad to see you still at it and keep up the good work. Thank you. Alrighty. Now that's the kind of thing we love. <laughs> Alright. So now Todd will work on this. He'll be uh, alternately inflating, cutting the jack line, using the paper to cool it some. 2002, or 2002 it says. Yeah. That was an early piece. That was an early piece. Now the paper is cooling, but he's also able to use that to straighten and shape. Now he's blowing and inflating the piece. By cooling the bottom, you can see that that point still remains at the tip. So it hasn't blown out too much there. He's increasing the diameter. And one of you commented before that you were afraid Todd was going to hit the floor with the piece when he leaned it over and blew like that. Well, he's not because he's used to it. But what is interesting is if you look at the height of Todd's bench compared to the one that Josh works at. So there's Todd at the bench that lets you seat with your legs bent in a normal pattern. And here's the other bench, which is probably a good 8 to 10 inches higher. 
And that's just uh, the choice of the glass maker. Okay, so now the piece has outgrown the door opening. So fortunately, we have multiple doors and he can open more of them to apply the heat. He's got a pair of calipers over here that he uses to check the diameter. And once he gets this to the diameter he wants, Josh will miraculously appear from around the corner to prepare a bit of glass for the foot. Patricia says, yes, it was 2002. She, she had to get out the magnifying glass. Now, was that to read the 2002 or because of the size of the vase? I'm kidding. Okay, by pointing it upward like that, he increased the diameter of it a little bit. Again, with the jack line, just a little bit of squeezing there. That jack line is really important. The jack line is what allows the separation or the transfer to the punny to take effect without breaking the piece. Again with the calipers. Did we get a squeak out of it? Almost. Okay. Almost. So that's that's just kind of a joke here in the studio. Uh, we have a friend and teacher, David McDermott, who has once or twice checked in on us. But David told us when he worked in the factory, if he used his calipers and brought them down along the outside of the piece, if his master didn't hear it drag just a little bit, he made him throw it away and start all over. Fortunately, we don't do, we, we're not that bad. Well, good morning, Marianne. Welcome aboard. So anybody just joining us, uh, Todd is making a fishnet patterned platter. So you can't see any of the fishnet now. So. That'll be the big reveal in a little while. Geez, feels like one of those home improvement shows. The big reveal. 450 pounds, uh, Cheryl, or just about 450. Todd's using a blow hose right now. You can see he blows in that. It's connected to the blowing iron. And he, oh, he's got a little, yeah, he's got some noise. Okay. And if Josh is watching the video, would you like me to call him over for the foot? Yeah, we're going to watch Josh remark miraculously appear to help yeah, with the foot. Hey! It's like I was watching from the, the back. miracle worker. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you maybe just do an extra block? I really don't know what to expect. I'd rather not have to go right off. So Josh is going to pick up a, a good bit of glass here. He's going to bring it over to the high chair. That's what we do with the younger glass blowers. We put them in the high chair. The blocking is to help shape it. It chills it just a tad on the outside. He still wants it to run. And he'll cut a little bit of a jack line into it so that it will separate from the pipe easily. And we'll follow along as he brings it over to Todd and then uh, Todd will grip the iron with his shears and will place this foot. Actually, we have a kind of different uh, crucible, Shirley, but I'll explain that later. He puts it down on the middle of the pleat piece and in that narrow portion cuts it off. No, the calipers don't uh, scratch it, or if they do, the reheating takes a scratch out. So we've got the foot placed well on there. And then Todd will be coming back to the bench to shape it up. So Cheryl Lee is a glass blower, and she asked about crucible. But in our furnace, the crucible is actually like a three-piece bathtub. It's oblong. I'm not sure where it comes from. I believe uh, France. And I'll ask Foster in just a minute. All right, so now Todd's shaping the foot and flattening it, and in just a moment, Josh will prepare the punty and bring it over for the transfer. At any rate, um, our furnace crucible is not just a pot. It is three pieces, oak, oak and it, uh, it's kind of cemented together. Foster, where does our, cru our uh, pot crucible come from? France? 
Oh, this one here, yeah. the ACS wire, is uh, manufactured in Hungary. Manufactured in Hungary. There you go. Okay. So now Todd has got the piece warmed up. He's got the foot on it. Josh is over here preparing the punty for the transfer. Just a little bit of glass hanging off the end of the pipe. We don't want a lot. Just a perfect amount. Todd will put that onto the bottom and begin to turn both pipes. And what he'll do is he'll watch the turning of the pipe that Josh has. If it's not bumping up and down like it's on a camshaft, that means that it's centered. He used his tweezers to straighten up the little bit that it needed. When they know that that's cooled and will hold fine, a little drop of water on the jack line, a tap, and off it comes. Good morning, David Hogan. Welcome aboard. Uh, we got Josh make. I'm sorry, Josh is flashing a beast. Todd is going to make us a fishnet platter. Okay. So uh, right now he's heating the lip area, and Josh is assisting on this piece. He's going to gather up some glass and run it through frit for a lip wrap. And he's got some blue glass over here, and this will form the lip wrap on the vessel. So now. Todd's keeping this thing centered, and every once in a while, he has to put it in the heat all the way, just so that it all stays warm. He's going to work on uh, his alignment and opening the lip just a tad. Getting a nice round shape in there. There you go, Joanna Rudnicka says, perfect transfer. And you know the beauty of this is, after all these months and all these broadcasts, we've got people watching that not only know what a transfer is, but when we've done it well. What do you think of that, Foster? I think, I think that's educating our public, <laughs> our folks who are watching, are learning so much that it's just translating and they could come in and almost make class themselves there you go there you go okay so we'll check in on josh i believe he's got all the fritty needs oh, he's, you can never have too much frit right. right never too much frit never too many chocolate chip cookies okay so he'll get that uh, melted in and shaped up in the meantime we've got todd over here and you can see how the uh, orange glow up there at the opening or the lip of the piece, it's very hot. He's going to gently round it. He's not going to increase the diameter a lot. He's going to still keep the opening hey, relatively right? slow. Let me get a real now, quick he and, he and Josh are talking back and forth about who's ready and who's not. What do you need? Oh. Okay. Uh, about 15 seconds. Josh has uh, got the lip wrap, Todd needs another flash. If he stays out of the heat too long and the glass temperature drops, particularly to 1,000 degrees or lower, it would likely crack. So that little bit of heat that he just applied made things really nice. Josh will bring the lip wrap from an angle. Todd will place it, turn the iron away from himself, and let the glass simply drape onto the lip. When he's got all that he wants, he'll pull it away. And just like when he uh, drained the glass on gathering, that little tail burned itself off. There you go. Uh, Barbara would like to know the approximate weight with all the glass you put on. Would you say about five pounds? About five pounds. Okay. The interesting thing about working with a glass, though, is like this. When it's on the end of a pipe that's about four feet from your body, the effective feel is much greater. Okay? So five pounds, as far as the effort to keep it turning and working, might actually feel like 20 or 25. Right now, Todd's going to go in, get the lip nice and round. Josh has two paddles, one to protect Todd's forearm, one to flatten the lip. So you can see that beautiful blue lip wrap on there. And now Todd's taking out the parchofi or wooden jack. 
and he'll go back for another reheat. So the bottom of the vessel, the portion near the foot, is, is pretty well formed and ready, okay? But he needs to get that top area opened up a little bit. He'll have it to the point where it's almost straight-sided, and then he'll do the spin-out for the platter. Okay, back he comes. He'll grab his parchofis for this step. Again, he'll get shielded and the lip will be flattened. And you can see a little bit of the pattern in there now. Those of you that joined this late. Okay, here we go. It's time. All right, so Tom's going to get all of it warm. Thank you, Rude. Uh, hope to see you back again soon. And uh, hey, catch it on the replay. Good to have you with us. All right, Todd's going. We're going to step back here so we can actually see the spinning as Todd is doing this. He's going to open the vessel up. Centrifugal force is going to flare it out. Now that he's out of the glory hole. He keeps it turning, and he'll even turn it as he points it downward. Notice he waits. He waited to point it downward. The glass is so hot, it wants to move. So rather than a flattened platter, this is a, a ruffled pattern, platter. Okay? And there he goes, and you can see that beautiful pattern, which will really show up tomorrow when it's uh, fully annealed. And right now, Josh is going to catch it in the insulated gloves, a little tap, a little water, a tap of the putty. Foster opens both doors of the annealer so Josh can get that beauty in there. And there we go. All right, let's hear it for Todd. Thank you, Todd. Beautiful piece. Beautiful piece. Okay, so there we have a fishnet platter with a uh, ruffled rim. Absolutely gorgeous. And for those of you that asked earlier, yes, the fishnet pattern was done by going into the optic mold twice, twisting in opposite directions, and that's how you get that crisscross pattern, okay? So uh, there we have uh, Todd. Josh is gonna show us how we get a drink of water around here. What are you going to make for us, Josh? So we're going to make a honeycomb vessel that you can see over on the table. Let's come on over and take a look. We've had a couple inquiries about the white and the honey honey pot. Yeah. So our friend Ramiro, you might see him in the chat every once in a while, made us a really cool mold, actually just by welding together ball bearings. And that's what gives us that really interesting pattern. Bruce will come on over and show you one of those. So there's a set of ball bearings that have been welded together and on the inside you can see the surfaces are exposed and that those little circles and the spaces in between are what's going to give us that hexagonal pattern on the final blowout. Cool. What colors what colors will you use? We're actually going to do the kind of the beehive pattern. The color. beehive. Okay, all righty. So those of you that have been admiring that piece sitting over there, you're yeah. going to get to see it made. Yeah. I'll grab some of mine. So we'll put the mold back on the floor for him. If you've got any questions about the process or the equipment or the color, uh, ask us. If we know the answer, we'll give it to you. If we don't, we'll make it up. <laughs> exactly. Actually, I, I don't think... I don't think I've made anything up today. I think we've been I think we've been pretty really? much on the level with them. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think I think That's this one's been pretty good. <laughs> the Ramiro has made quite a few molds for us. Here's another one. I'll reach under and grab this. This is the mold he made to do the diamond-shaped ornament. So it's even got a little cutout right here in the top. You close this around the blowpipe, blow real hard, 
and out comes your diamond shape. So we've got several like that. So we're really grateful that uh, Romero has that as a hobby too. Josh has got the color bit on there. It's a piece of gold. And uh, is that an opaque? That's an opaque, yeah. Okay. So if we have that nice transparent iris gold over top that opaque gold. Okay. So a slightly different tone over top of it, a double layer of golds there. Yeah, you'll get kind of highlights where it's a little bit thicker. So if you look at that piece around the edges, it's a little thicker, so it's a darker gold color. And in the center of those kind of diamond patterns, it's a little bit lighter. Cool. Yeah. About the same size as the other one? Yeah, about the same size. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, Antoinette was asking, and I'd guess that one to be about what, eight inches in diameter, 10 inches tall? Maybe nine? Say nine by nine. Nine by nine, okay, there you go. So Josh took the uh, piece of gold opaque glass and pre-warmed that in our annealer. And just like we pre-warm our pipes so that they gather glass well, glass sticks to the hot metal a lot easier. He got the gold on there. Now it's secure on the end of the blowing iron. It's going to block it up a little bit and shape it. And at the very most, he'll just introduce a small amount of air into this. Not much at all. Sometimes not any. So a very soft blow. And then he'll be taking his finger off in just a second there. Just wants a little bit of air to get things started. As we mentioned earlier, we don't want too much air in the pieces early on. How would the gold foil work with the honeycomb? It would work, yeah. yeah. Same kind of idea. You would have kind of denser amounts of gold around the edges of that honeycomb, and in the center of the honeycomb, it would be a little bit lighter. Yep. All right, so now that's cooled off enough, he'll take his first gather. Yeah, any more questions like that, fire away. And be sure to like and share and comment. Comments are going to get you entered in the drawing. Uh, they usually give me a piece of paper with the winner's name, but I can't remember now if it was Michelle or Veronica. <laughs> Michelle Machino? Machino? Theta's always monitoring. She'll put the winner's name up here in the comments for us. I'll get the piece of paper next week so we know. So Josh will probably put a layer of two or clear on this. And then gather the frit. The frit will be toward the outside, right? Yep, right on the surface. Right on the surface the before he goes in the mold. The same layer as the so these layers are going to build up his volume. Notice how long he let that sit before he even put a little bit of air in it. It is still growth, but he doesn't want it to go out of control. So that was a, a really good stretch of time there that he just let the piece sit. Is there a limit to the size of the piece when using the honeycomb mold? Well, unless Ramiro makes us a lot more of them, this is the size, which is about five inches in diameter at the top, four and a half to five, you'd say? Yeah. Okay, so that we have to get into that, all right? However, because Josh is not allowing this glass to get a lot of air in it and inflate it, Michelle Vecchio, thank you, Theta, appreciate that. You gotta remember that the rest of the broadcast, Josh. Michelle Vecchio. I'm gonna remember you. Michelle, you remember Vecchio. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, Josh is able to gather a lot of glass, but not inflate it to a huge diameter, and that will keep it compact enough to go into that mold. So that's the uh, that's our limit 
on what we can do for the size of it. But by keeping the walls of the vessel thick at this point, he'll be able to expand it and blow it out a lot more later. So here we go with the gold frit. Turning the iron in the bowl, just tapping gently, picking it up on the hot glass. Okay. Going with that? That's good. Okay. So now you can see the gold thread on the top. You don't even see the opaque gold below. When I come out, you're not Now go. he's going to heat this a lot. Uh, I think that might be the 2180, is it? What's that? The frit. The frit. 2180. Okay. So for those of you that aren't glass blowers, uh, one of our viewers is yes, and uh, Bridget uh, asked if that was the oxidizing. Well, actually, we call it reducing, but it is the transfer of oxygen. And if it's introduced into an oxygen starved flame, that's what it gets. In fact, you can see a little bit of the process taking place at the blowpipe right now. Okay, so that's a reducing color and it's a zero frit. And for those of you that aren't glass blowers, the zero just uh, is about the grain or the size of the grind. So it's kind of like the, the difference between grinding for espresso and a regular cup of coffee. So a really fine grind, the es espresso is our zeros or powders. For your Mr. Coffee, we might be using a two or three frit. Hey, we can't take this too seriously. All right, so now you can see that even without uh, increasing the volume a whole lot, okay, he's got that uh, a diameter that will go down into the mold. It'll fit just fine. And now he's going to heat it up a lot. He's got his fingers crossed that he doesn't get stuck. <laughs> if I get stuck, it's Romero's fault. Okay. So he wants this super hot and he's going to blow really hard. He needs to throw the glass out into those little ridges. So when he does that, he'll need to suck in just a little bit to release it and wiggle it out. And it'll be hot enough that it actually drips, it elongates, he blows hard, draws in, now he starts to wiggle and out he comes. And there is our pattern. Okay. Cooling the tip keeps it from inflating there. You'll notice that it didn't grow too large at that point. And from here on out, the important thing is to not let it get cold. Those ridges will remain as long as he keeps the glass hot and keeps it moving, keeps it going. If he lets the glass get cold and completely stable, he'll have to reheat it to the point that the ridges would melt out. And those of you that are glass blowers probably know from when you first made any pieces, you've got a lot of pieces that you put in the optic mold and never saw the ridges again because you had to heat it so much on your return to the glory hole. Look at these beautiful uh, hexagons in here, great design, and you can still see that the pipe is glowing. He's still got a lot of heat in it. So he's going to save his design. Is Romero in the chat? Romero's on. All right. Nice job, Romero. <laughs> <laughs> if it hadn't worked, was it going to be Romero's fault? Exactly. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Now, again, with the newspaper, for those of you who may be joining us late, it's about seven or eight sheets of newsprint folded up into a pad about oh seven by seven or seven by eight inches when it's wet it's a perfect insulator and allows it to shape the glass by hand just as a potter would so there's the newspaper pad right there so 
So you'll notice that Josh has not spent a lot of time out of the glory hole, and he hasn't had to reheat it a lot. By maintaining the heat in the pieces, he works. He's going to give it a little bit of length here for some shaping. And once again, with the paper to cool it so it doesn't move there. And now the cheater bit. A little button of glass right on the bottom. There's frit on the outside of this piece. And we're going to attach a putty to it. So if the putty was attached directly to the frit, there might be the possibility of pulling a layer of frit off when we break the putty free. So in this case, he's not as much worried about the bottom of the piece cracking. He wants to make sure that he doesn't pull the design off the bottom after we're done with the piece and take it off of the putty. The so Foster's preparing the putty over there on the marver. Josh is making sure it's flattened. And in just a moment, Foster will deliver the putty and Josh will begin to place it and then uh, do you need a Sofietta? No. Okay. They'll make sure that it's cool enough and they'll do the transfer. All right, Foster will present the iron. Josh will get that all centered up Look at the iron. You don't see it bumping up and down. That's because it's centered. Josh pulls the neck, taps the pipe, and off it comes. All right, Ramiro's asked a question. I'll give my answer. He asked if it's easier to work with a pineapple mold or a ball bearing mold. And I'll say the ball bearing mold. Just one down. Ramiro would like your opinion on what's easier to work with, the ball bearing mold or the pineapple mold? If you ask me today, I'd say the ball bearing yeah, mold. Yeah, me too. That would, that would be my... So, uh, those of you that may not be glass blowers and uh, are wondering about the pineapple mold, we've also called that the diamond optic mold in the past. And I'll show you... Uh, exactly what that looks like on the inside here. Actually, they're preparing a color lip wrap here. So I'll grab a pineapple mold. So you can look down in that and it's almost like a row of shark's teeth, but they actually are diamond shaped, okay? And that's what gives us the diamond pattern, hence the name diamond mold. And it also gives a look of something like a pineapple. So a lot of folks call it a pineapple mold. So those sharp points are a lot easier to deal with than the, I mean, are harder to deal with than the rounded pieces of the ball bearing. Foster's got the, uh, we got black on there. We got black for the lip wrap. Foster's got it on there, shaping it up a little bit. Then he'll get it really hot. And just like you, we hope you saw uh, Todd make his piece a little earlier, we'll drape on the hot glass around the lip. Is the pattern showing up on camera? What's that? Is the pattern Oh yeah, the up? pattern is beautiful. It's okay. showing up. And this is a, a really good indication of the fact that he never let it get cold, so he never had to superheat it and melt the pattern. Foster's coming over with the lip wrap. He'll approach from behind and the side. Josh places it, then he'll begin to turn the iron away from himself and let the glass drape on for the lip wrap, then he'll pull straight down and it'll burn itself off. So it got so thin there and it was still hot that it just burned away. He didn't have to cut it. Now, if the, piece of, if the uh, lip wrap had been a little colder, sometimes we have to cut them off a little bit, but uh, this time it worked out perfectly. All right, so now, it's going to be a matter of straightening, flattening, open the lip a little bit, opening things up, and getting the design he wants for this uh, honey pot, his beehive. You'll notice he has the piece a good ways out of the glory hole while he heats the lip. 
then occasionally the whole piece goes in for what we call a flash heat. If he lets this get below a thousand degrees, it's a goner. So now Josh gets it centered, gets his jacks in the piece as he wants, and has Foster flatten the lip for him as he opens it up. He can use the jacks to constrict that neck area a little bit, and he can also slope them outward to give a little bit of taper to it. Beautiful. Really nice color combination. Ah, well, Cheryl will uh, let Ramiro know and uh, we'll ask about it. So uh, Cheryl from out in Colorado wants to know if the creator of the mold wants to sell one, which is really great, but uh, we'll let Ramiro uh, talk to Foster and get in touch with you later on. And what he has said is that they're exclusive to Art of Fire. Oh, okay. Nothing personal, that's just... That's just the way it is. is. Okay, so I guess the short answer is N-O. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there is a beautiful piece. Oh man, that's gorgeous. All righty, so another uh, reheat here. little drop of water between the putty and that little button, a tap and it comes right off and into the annealer it goes. Beautiful, wonderful piece. All right folks, let's hear it for Josh, let's hear it for Foster. And let's hear it for and Ramiro. Ramiro. Yes, uh, thank you very much Ramiro. Okay, all right, so there's no program today. What are you going to do next or is Todd going to do us a piece? What's up next? So come on, I was thinking what you the table. So we have some kind of newer colors that we've been playing with and we really enjoy the colors. Kind of have a pink version, purple green, mm -hmm. and stormy seas. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah. I like that one. But it's really interesting. Frit mixes. Yeah, oh, frit yeah. mixes. But when you put it in the optics, you really get this nice draping pattern. Oh, yeah. And that's what we're going to play with today. You can also see, same with the ball bearing mold, the color's a little denser in those optics mm -hmm. and gets a little bit lighter and moves differently between the optics in those thinner spots. So we're going to play with that a little bit. With okay. The frit and the optics. Which one are you going to use? We're going to use the Stormy Seas. All righty. That blue All green right, mix. There you go. Beautiful yep. frit mix. Yep. And we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So we're getting things put away right here now. Here's the stormy seas. Well, I'll let you guys handle that. I'll get it out of the way. Just spread it out on the fire. Okay. So we're getting set up for the next one. And what I'd like to remind you also is to visit our website, please. You can find all kinds of pieces that you haven't seen on display or made today. We've got a very extensive catalog. Or you can call the studio at 301-253-6642. And if you want to talk to any of us or find out. Uh, I don't think, no, they're not Sunspot's color, Ted. Uh, they're Frit Mixes. Uh, I think they might be from, uh, well, let me ask. Who, do, who does the Frit Mixes? Uh, Olympic does. Olympic does them. Olympic Color Rod does those. Okay, so anyway, uh, check out our online uh, presence, artofire.com. Give us a call if you've got special requests. We've also made pieces during these demonstrations that have been special orders. So if there's something that you'd particularly like to see made for yourself or someone you know, uh, let us know. We'll coordinate with you and we can make it while you watch. So uh, please get in touch with us. Remember to like, share, and uh, now we're going to put me and Josh to the test. Whoa, who? 
who won the prize from last week? It was Michelle. Vecchio. Vecchio? Vecchio. Ah, oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, this is the piece that Michelle won right here. This uh, beautiful uh, pinkish frit vase with a swirl. And this little green guy is the one for next week. That's what we're going to give. Yeah, yeah, Antoinette, we knew that. Uh -huh. We're aware of the, the transfer of the companies. So anyway, this is our giveaway for next week. So if you comment, you'll get entered in a drawing for that piece. So, uh, and Michelle gave us a smiley face. Well, Michelle, I tried uh, to tell Josh the only way we were going to remember without it written down was each of us to remember one name. He failed me on that. Actually, he got it. So, here we are. So, oh, this is the frit right here. It's a frit mix. So these are fairly common colors individually, but someone with a good eye for color put them together and they make a really beautiful frit mix. Okay, so we're ready to roll. It's got the preheated iron. So you just saw I was looking at the end. Why was I looking at the end, Bruce? Well, lots of times people leave a little bit of color behind. And Josh has a theory that if you don't clean it out, you won't have any color blow out. I haven't had that experience yet. Usually, if I leave it alone, I get somebody else's color coming out. So. And Foster's the same way as you, right? He, he cleans his out. Yep. Every time I clean mine out, I get color in my Actually, I don't clean it every time, but if I notice somebody left a good sized chunk of color on the end of it, I'll go ahead and uh, clear it out. So the way we clean the pipes of color right there, in case uh, you're wondering, is we heat the pipe up a lot, and then we can take a pair of tweezers and put them into the opening at the bottom of the pipe there, and as we turn the pipe, scrape out any residue color. So, so tell me when you can actually see the when what when you can actually see the pipe and that's yeah we can see the bubble. pipe can you okay just yeah. want to make sure you can see the bubble coming out so when Kristen Kristen Zumar bought that uh, honey pot that Josh just made oh okay oh, cool all yeah, right cool. wonderful yeah. thank you that's all a great righty piece. yeah, thank yeah. You very much. Congratulations, Kristen Zumar just bought the piece you saw made. That's wonderful. going to pick up the stormy seas color on the outside of the gather. Now this one I do go through the color twice. Okay. Just because I want the color kind of overlap a little bit. And you achieve that just by going through the color a second time. Wow, somebody said we wrote something about missing a W-2. Antoinette said she already had her return. Taxes? Oh, is that right? Yeah, and I'm getting ready to file for my extension. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna wait till October again? What's that? Are you gonna wait till October to No, no, file it? no. I've I've got it I've got it just about done. <laughs> Every year Bruce says, oh, I'll just wait till October to finish my taxes. No, nah, that puts that too much. There is no difference in the pressure between uh, normally April 10th and April 15th to October 10th and 15th. So, uh, got a little issue to solve, but I'll get them done. The thing that Josh finds even more remarkable is, though, that. I have yet to do anything other than my taxes by hand 
and through the mail. Well, I can just imagine you sitting there with your little green hat on and your little... Oh, yeah. <laughs> calculator. <Your little> calculator. <laughs> I'll try to file electronically this year. <laughs> Alright, so he's got the optic ridges in it, just as he described, and you can see the density of the color on the deep part of the ridges. That's where the glass blew out into the optic mold. Okay? And as he continues the process and blows it out larger, that will stretch apart even more. Oh, I, I have an advance to an adding machine, Antoinette. I still use an abacus. <laughs> okay, now he's going to heat this up. It's going to be a, a tall piece? Yeah, I think okay. it's a piece. Ah, Cindy Martin says she's glad to know there are other procrastinators out there. Yeah, isn't, isn't it amazing how many of us can have the same middle name? Now you're starting to see, as he slows the rotation a little bit here, there you see the separation and the stretching apart. Beautiful. Alrighty. So, uh, when we're going to elongate the piece, as I've told you many times before, we basically start with a sphere and a jack line. But we want to elongate the piece if we have a particular diameter in mind, we're going to start with a sphere that's larger than that diameter because once we swing it out and elongate it, that diameter will decrease. So by pointing it downward and then gently swinging, and you can even hold it still, and then a little bit of centrifugal force, those things combined gives him a beautiful taper down to that bullet nose. So he started out with a diameter on that sphere larger than what he wanted for the finished product because he knew it was going to decrease. Notice when he comes out, he just takes it easy first, then a little spin. Now a lot of times when we do that twirling around like that, the glass does not stay round. It doesn't keep the cylindrical shape just simply because of the weight distribution. But we can take care of that if needed with just a little bit of air. And if we don't need to, then we don't bother. Now Josh is hooking up the blow hose and you can see just a little bit of a uh, taper right in the, about the bottom gonna, third of it. We're going to give it a little bit of a foot. Okay. So he's going to use that to blow, he's going to use the blow hose to blow, and then he'll be able to use a hand tool at the same time. So he wants that constriction. He's pinching in with his hand, holding the newspaper, and he's able to blow it out some. Now you can really see the separation of the colors in the spaces between the ridges. Yeah, Bridget, it is. It's a tall piece, that's for sure. So be sure to comment. That'll get you entered in the drawing for next week's little green vase. And congratulations to Michelle Vecchio, who won the uh, beautiful little uh, pink swirled uh, frith bowl. And now we're going to get to flattening the bottom, so this baby will sit up on your tabletop. So notice that Josh has just heated the lower couple of inches, and what he'll do is hold the piece with the paper to keep it from moving at that point. And you notice when Foster pushes, there's a little bit of a bulge toward the foot, there's kind of a sweep in the line, and that's because of where he placed the heat. So by running that heat up a good two or three inches, he's able to get the taper down to that point and then have it flare out for the foot.
So we're going to get a cheater on this also. Foster's going to bring the bit over. Josh will put it on there. And when he pulls back and trails away, watch the glass just burn right off. And then he can take and press that little button into place. And now he's got a little landing pad for the punty. Foster's taking another iron now. He'll gather some glass and make the putty for Josh. The final flattening so the piece does sit flat on a tabletop. And if you uh, contact us, this could be yours. Anybody wants to purchase the Stormy Seas vase that's made today, get in touch with Theta. Uh, we had Kristen pick up the, uh, the honeycomb piece, the beehive. Josh is giving it another flash. He's getting ready for Foster. So watch the pipe. Watch as Josh turns the pipes. If he sees that moving up and down a lot, that would mean that it's not centered, but it doesn't move up and down a lot. So he's got it directly in the center of the piece, lets it cool for just a few moments. If it's too hot, it would drop toward the floor when Foster uh, had it on the putty alone. Here we go with a drop of water, a tap of the pipe, and off it comes. Now Foster's ready to get that up into the heat, and he'll start heating the lip. Josh will come over and take it. Now, if we see the piece bobbing up and down still, it means the punty is hot. But it wasn't so much, so now he's able to put the whole thing in for a flash, and now it's work out the top. Almost all of our vessels are made by completing either the lower half to two-thirds of the vessel first, then transferring to another iron and finishing it off. Now that lip area was cold enough to fracture, which means it's going to take a little while to reheat to get to the point you can work it. That's why he's only heating that portion, but you'll notice him with all these flash heats. And he doesn't have to do them for very long at a time, because he's doing them consistently. He does it over and over. Never for long enough to distort the lower part of the vessel, but getting enough heat into that lift that he can come back and work it. You can see where the heat's concentrated in the upper part of the vessel. The strap of the jacks flattens the lip a little bit, and now the blades of the jacks. We obviously can't put our fingers in there to open it up. If I change the angle on the jack, it gets a really beautiful flare on there. You can use the jacks over the uh, neck of it to cut down on it a little bit, constrict the opening. So if you've got some daffodils or uh, uh, forsythia still blooming, it would look really great in this. All right, so he's going to keep working that lip. Fat Foster's got a paddle on the standby, in case we need it. He's got a beautiful profile on the top of that. The jack straddling the glass constricts it a little, and also leaning out against the lip gives him a beautiful taper. There we go. So he's going to use the steam cone now. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, it's a wooden cone, it's a solid cone, it rests in water. As soon as he puts that into the hot glass, the water evaporates, the resultant steam will cause an expansion in the shoulder of the vessel. So look to the left of the jack line when he does that. Stabilizing it, watch the left of the jack line, and you see it okay. okay. So sometimes we go back for another try. So if the opening is a little too large for the steam cone to go in, we need to make a smaller opening, but that's easy enough to do. 
You take the jacks, put them over the top of the vessel, straddle the neck, and squeeze down on it gently. So by squeezing down, he constricts that opening. He'll get that down to the point that the steam stick will go in. He's going to test it, and yes, it will seat. And there it goes, it blows on up. Now he's got a nice shoulder line on top of that. One more reheat and probably just fine tune the neck and lip and we'll be done with it. Okay, so that didn't quite work out, so he wants a little bit more. He's going to use this Sofietta instead of the steam stick. So, uh, he'll get this string. Look, now Foster's over there sanitizing the mouthpiece. And what Josh will do is put that metal cone into the glass and blow into it. So it's just an alternative. Either that or get a bigger steam cone. <laughs> Again, when he does this, the inflation is going to take place, in this case, to the right of the jack line. There you see the shoulders inflating. Now he can use his jacks to straighten it out. Foster will put a little bit of paddle pressure on there against it just to straighten the lip. And there we go. All righty. There you go, folks. All right, a flash. And then Foster's going to glove up and catch it, and it'll be in the annealer. They are beautiful colors, Joanna. And Chris, he... why don't you show them the... What's that? Gonna... Oh, okay. So, uh, let's see. They're saying I should show you what else is in the annealer. I'd be glad to. Although, did you put the uh, honey? Okay, so Kristen Zumar. Oh, there it is from the top. That's your uh, uh, beehive. How much does this type of vase cost? Antoinette, I'm not absolutely sure. We'd have to have uh, Foster or Theta weigh in on that. Let me get back around to them, or let me get back to Foster, and we'll see. Almost looks like it could be made out of Connemara marble. Yeah, it, it could. It's just absolutely beautiful. So, Foster, we got somebody inquiring as to how much that piece might cost. This piece here? Yeah. Uh, we'll have to ask Josh. Okay, we'll ask Josh after they get it all put away and everything. And we got Todd back down there making cats still. So, $167. $167. Okay, there you go. There's your price. So we'll go on back down here to the counter and take a look at things again. So this is the color pattern and just as Josh explained about how the colors would push apart and separate in between the ridges, you can see it right there. And if we hold this piece up, you can see through it in those points. Alrighty, beautiful piece. And this is the twin to the other piece he just made. And uh, Kristen Zumar, the new one, will be on its way to you. And uh, so what's next? So. We did a YouTube video a little earlier today, and Todd works with Ashes making cats. So we're actually gonna show you folks how that process works. And we can actually use Ashes from cats, dogs, your loved ones, and we can actually put those in the paperweights or little rubbing stones. So come on over, I'll show you some of the different options we have. Todd, do you have any? Yeah, here we go. So we have a lot of folks that bring in ashes and we make what we call rubbing stones and these are nice because you can put them in your pocket carry them around with you and it's just a nice way to remember you know a loved one a cat a dog whatever it may be 
Oh, yes, the cats. Yep, and this is what Todd's going to be making for us today. All right. One of the cats with the ashes in them. Okay, wonderful. So he's finishing up a piece. It'll just be another second, and then we'll get started. Okay. And Barbara Gould Belzer says the ashes work well in rondelles. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, vases, uh, bowls, rondelles, paperweights. So you can see the company we work with, they send out a little tube, and you just need a little bit of the ashes put in there, just up to that line. Todd actually sprinkles it out onto the marble, and it really doesn't take much. And those ashes actually stick to the glass, and then Todd gathers more clear glass over top of it, so those ashes will always be inside the glass forever, really. So that's the nice thing about it. And the beauty of the solid pieces is you don't have to worry about breaking it. That's right. So you've got another cat right there. We'll go through the whole process in a moment, but there is the sleeping cat. Now what he'll do is he'll break that off of the iron. There'll be a little bit of a nub of glass left where it was cut. And he'll simply melt that in and then press it flat. So you can see that it's not quite flat on the bottom. But we know that's happening. So by taking a torch, he'll heat that up and press it flat. Oh wow, Barbara Gould Bells says she's got several ornaments that contain ashes mm -hmm. yeah. below yeah, Okay, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, we've, we've done quite a few of those around here. So, yeah, if any of you are interested in that sort of thing, get in touch with us. So Todd's getting that hot. He's going to flip it over. And now with his insulated glove, press down hard onto it on the marble. This will flatten the bottom. Uh, the, the ashes are usually visible in the piece. It can depend partly on the colors chosen. But there you go right there. You can see to the left to buy that ear with the ashes. So now, Todd's actually going to run through an entire one here for you in just a moment. Let me see if we'll I can show you that process. We did have um, one. Do you have the one with just the ashes, Todd? Uh, I thought we had one at one point. Well, we had one at one point, but not anymore. Not but anymore. this is uh, everything we can ship it out. It's oh, gold, okay. Huh? So that's a gold color, just the gold color, and the white you're seeing is the ashes? Yes. Yeah, cool. So you get, yeah, so it's definitely mm -hmm. visible. And uh, they... Yeah, that's great. Look nice. Actually, Antoinette, that's, that's not a scary glove. It's a well-insulated glove that he uses because it's got several layers to it. Now, it is composed of the cast-offs of a couple of gloves. But uh, he wouldn't be doing Cast it. Offs. I say the volunteers in the service. Tributes. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're tributes. The Hunger Games. Yeah. <laughs> I volunteer. I like cast offs. <laughs> okay, so uh, Todd will get set up with what colors are you going to use on the next one? This one is black as well. I, I just go with what uh, what the request is and fill the order. Okay. Uh, sometimes they even ask for an inscription. Uh, we put the uh, put that on the bottom of the little figure as well. Do you ever do it to make it look like the cat? To make it look like the cat? Yeah, say the like a... Uh, no, like the, oh. the cat itself. Like if they send you a picture. Do they ever send yes. you a picture? Yeah, I do. I get, uh, I get lots of requests. There you go. People send me photographs and ask me to match. Oh, the wow. And yeah. Uh, I mean, I've got an envelope full of requests and thank you notes and this. Oh, cat. my goodness. Can I get it to look like this? And I do the best I can. Okay. Some spirit pieces out of Austin, Texas. If you're interested, look them up. They do a great job, great people, very, uh, I mean, just everybody's really enthusiastic about what we're doing. We all contribute. All right, so we're going to do one just out of black. Okay. Now, how about any vessels? Do you put any vessels? So you can see it's got some irons laid up over there by the opening of the glory hole. Um, in a lot of studios, this is how people warm up their irons. 
in the uh, glory hole or just putting it into the furnace and getting it warm from the heat. So anything that will get that pipe pre-warmed and the glass will stick to it. So Bruce, can you put ashes in a blown piece? Can you put ashes in a blown piece? I can! You could. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, yeah, there's no reason you couldn't. You just wouldn't want to break it. <laughs> I just, I do a little uh, bud base as well. Yeah. A little eight-inch tall bud base for a long, elongated teardrop shape. Put lip on the outside. Crack okay. Fit. We're just popping the deck here with the shirties. We need to stand high. We'll move it off. Okay. <laughs> Well, Cindy Martin says she loves your filing system. So, whatever works. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, the... There's the ashes spread out onto the marver now. A little dust. And he's got his black frit. All right. So, on the... Uh, YouTube video we did earlier today, we had uh, one of our viewers from uh, Netherlands, uh, Rude, uh, was talking about maybe he'd do one of these, make one. So we kind of just gave him a description of the process with a few more of the points that are involved. And he actually works without a furnace. So picking up cullet or shards of glass is harder. Okay, but so for those of you that are glass blowers and have a furnace available, Here's your process. So we've got our first gather of glass, and Todd's going to let this elongate, and he's just, this is the core. This is what's going to form the basis for it, and this is also going to help keep glass off of the pipe. He'll gather over all of that, but he'll have more glass off the end. So now, by rolling the iron back and forth, varying the pressure and the angle, you can see he's got a little bit of a tapered cylinder on there. To let that cool significantly so I can gather over it. And then when he gathers over that, he'll come over and pick up his frit. And then the shaping of this and the distribution of the heat is really important because that's what makes it successful. So right now you can see how wobbly that glass is hanging off the end of the iron. The sole purpose right now is to pick up the black frit. So by going round and round in the bowl, He'll get the frit that he needs. And he's not too worried at this moment whether it stays perfectly symmetrical. He'd like to keep the semblance of a cylinder, but it doesn't have to be perfectly round. It's going to get to that point a little later on. I'm just going to heat this up plenty. And now, for the ashes. Simply rolling through. And you can already see them adhering to the black. So it looks like some little white specks on top of the black. Okay, so there he's got all of that gathered up. Now what he's going to do is pre-shape this. Not fully shaped to the final form of the piece but just to get enough so that when he does the gather, the glass that goes on top of this will be distributed like he wants. So one thing he'll do is lower his hands and push the glass off the pipe. See that angle right there? And you can see the glass near the pipe stretching away. Now by inverting the angle and letting it hang down a little bit and turn, he's kind of made like an elongated diamond shape out of this. It tapers up from the pipe, to the mid uh, point about a third of the way down and then it tapers back down to a point. Ramiro's setting us up. He, he's like, I've already mentioned the uh, uh, gift certificates. He or Patrick usually remind me to mention gift certificates. So now he's asking if we do any award pieces. Why, yes. So, why, <laughs> yes. Glad you asked. We'll show you a uh, flame and a bird in a moment, but let's watch Todd first. 
All right, so he's got that pre-shaped and that elongated diamond. He's going to gather the glass, let a little bit strip off back into the furnace. Then he'll judge how much he has there. If he wants, he'll peel some off with his shears and cut it off. You can see where the color is inside that clear coating. And you can see how similar this shape is to what he had with the black and the ashes before he went into the furnace. By pulling just a little bit more, he elongates it and cuts some more off. Now he's got that nice tapered shape going. And using the marver right here, notice the angle of the glass. He's got it inclined downward and by that glass contacting the table, it's making a longer tapered cone. When he inverts that and puts the glass near the pipe upward, that pushes it off. So this is the shape that makes the cat. Have you made dog shapes, Tom? I've done different things to interpret a dog, but most I've done really lately Instead of keeping the ears pointed, hmm. I flatten them and then flip them down. Um, dogs are a little bit more difficult to do because breeds are so particular for shape and form. Where cats, a sleeping cat, sleeps like every hey. other sleeping cat. All right, so he's got it really hot now, and he's just letting it hang a little bit. He's not in a hurry, and now. He'll let it fall. See how he's raised the tail in, turns away gently. Now when he pulls down, the glass will just cast right away from it. And now he'll pull two ears. He'll reach into that portion that's the head that's wrapped by the tail, pull the ear out, and then another one. I have a dog. Bridget. Bridget Blakemore is getting into it like Romero, oh. helping us with reminders. She's asking if we've ever made special spirit pieces like a phoenix chick hatching from an egg. <laughs> Glad you guys are with us on this. Okay, so now he's using the shears. He's holding this piece upright so that it flattens a little bit against the shears right now. So if you maybe ordered one of the Maryland cats for the uh, No Kid Hungry. Same floor. These cats sort of started uh, sort of so now you can see the little bump that's on the bottom right there. That would prevent it from sitting flat. So he's going to torch the bottom of that. Then flip it over and press that against the metal table. And then the marver will help flatten it and it will be able to sit perfectly smooth. He flips it over. And presses down hard. Once it's sitting flat, into the annealer it goes. And there you have it. Wow, a couple of people responded by saying they had the Maryland cats. That's really great. Yeah, so what Real started off with just a little paperweight 10 something years ago between spirit pieces making memorable things for people who've lost a pet to coming up with something that we can sell and donate uh, for charity and they've really turned into something nice and uh, valuable. Great. Thank you very much. You're let's welcome. hear it for Todd. Come on folks. Let's have some let's have some hearts and some thumbs up and stuff. Well don't run away from me Josh. What's next? I think that's you think that's it? I think that's it. Okay. Okay. All righty. Oh, no, I wanted to show you. I pulled out oh, some Oh, our... yeah, we got some of our awards here. So, these are the, uh, this is a flame. And we'll just walk around that a little bit. It's got a really 
graceful twist to it. It's a solid sculpture. It's got uh, two layers of blue colors in it, a denser one and darker one in the center, surrounded by another. And then we've got the apple here. And uh, we've actually made some that are uh, actually look like red apples. Occasionally someone would want to give a gift to a teacher or something like that. These happen to be for awards. Speak of the devil, here comes the, the red apple. The stem broke The stem off, broke, but, but uh, here's what it looks like in, in red. Okay? And then uh, you might have watched last week when for Mother's Day someone ordered a cardinal and Josh made us a cardinal. But there's another group of folks that want these little red birds and they give them out as awards. So after yep. the pieces are out of the annealer, they're uh, ground flat if necessary, and then glued to these stands. So, yep, we do a lot of that. I think the bird is for breast cancer. It breast goes, cancer it goes to, a, I guess, a nurse that was awarded for help with breast cancer. Oh, And then okay. these are the Blue Cross Blue Shield Awards. Blue Cross Blue Shield has a blue apple. Great. Okie doke. All right, well, thanks for joining us today, and uh, come back next week, and we'll do it again. Bye-bye.